So let's get started. Welcome everyone. Good morning, good afternoon and good evening to you, depending on where you join us from today. Today, I am very excited to be part of uh, this conference. It is a great honor to to be in such an area now that I, I think this is the first time really that, uh, that I am uh, part of this conference. Thank you again for all the sponsors, the organizers, uh, big kudos for all the, all the whole setup and, and all the support we got from the organizers as well. Please remember to join the quiz um, by the end of the day because you can win amazing prizes. And with that, let me get started. So in the last few years, artificial intelligence has become more and more prevalent and powerful. Many speeches around AI nowadays explain how these technologies can be benefited to predict stock prices and create value for an organization. And in fact, even the online courses that are meant to educate newcomers in the field are focusing on the financial benefits of AI. And in today's materialistic world, I would like to focus on how the very same technologies can be benefited to predict natural disasters and eventually increase survival rates and improve quality of life. I am Eve Pardy, Senior Analyst at Avanade. And at Avanade, we tailor the right mix of expertise, knowledge and agile delivery to support the client's individual digital transformation journey. And we always deliver engaging and easy to use uh, solutions fast and we use scalable technologies powered by Microsoft. So if you would like to join our Orange family, please don't hesitate to contact me. I have been an AI MVP for more than a year now, and since that I am involved in different community activities. For example, I am a board member of the Global AI Community and co-owner of AI42. Both are aiming to share knowledge in the field of AI with the community. But AI42 aims to provide valuable series of lectures that will help people to jumpstart their career in the fields of data science and artificial intelligence. And in the following weeks, we are going to have great speakers who bring you rich content about data science, machine learning, deep learning, including tools such as Power BI, Databricks, and a lot more. So if you want to be updated about our next sessions and news, follow us on Instagram, Facebook and Twitter. You can scan our QR code to get to our YouTube page where you can watch our previous lectures. And at our meetup page, you can find information about our upcoming sessions. I additionally write articles and speak about my investigations and projects at conferences or other community events too. For example, the session I hold today will, should be available on my uh, blog later in the weekend. So my aim is to save lives and support humanity with AI and data. It is also important to make people safe while using intelligent applications and make developers understand how they should control their solutions and hence gain their clients' trust. So I would be very happy to answer all your questions after the session. And if you stuck somewhere while trying out the tools I showed today, feel free to reach out to me. You can find me on LinkedIn, Twitter and Facebook too, but you might as well write me an email. The disasters caused by natural phenomena have been present all along human history. Nevertheless, their consequences are greater each time. And this tendency will not be reverted in the coming years. On the contrary, it is expected that natural disasters will increase in number and intensity due to the global warming. According to world statistics, the increase in the number of world disasters between the decades of 1987 and 96 and 1997 to 2006 was 60%, going from 4,241 to 6,806, whereas the number of dead people during these periods increased 100%. It went from 
more than 600,000 to more than 1.2 million. And in the coming years, this tendency will not be reverted. And it is foreseen mm -hmm. that natural phenomena will increase in number and intensity due to global warming. More than 9 million Australians have been impacted by a natural disaster or extreme weather event in the past 30 years. And the number of people affected annually is expected to grow as the intensity and in some areas the frequency of these events continues to grow. And these costs include significant and often long-term social impacts, including death and injury, as well as impacts on employment, education, community networks, health and well-being. Humans have been trying to predict earthquakes at least since first century China. And when they use this device, like a jar with uh, metal dragons facing each compass direction and surrounded by frogs with their mouths open, and if the ground shook somewhere in the region, the metal ball would fall and the dragon's mouth would and would drop out into the frog's mouth, roughly indicating the direction of the earthquake. And many similar predictions actually sounded reasonable. But after some research, those things were concluded to be natural phenomena with little to no correlation to earthquakes. AI, however, relies solely on data. And multiple researchers are creating their own applications to predict earthquakes and aftershocks. Moreover, these systems also monitor aging infrastructure. So AI can detect deformations in structures, which can be used to reduce the damage caused by um, collapsing buildings and bridges or subsiding roads. So during this talk, you will see a real life example of saving more lives with artificial intelligence, like how to examine a natural disaster, how to use that observation to save more lives. Now, let me show you a story that motivated me to use AI to save more lives. So in April 2015, there was an earthquake with 7.8 magnitude and an epicenter in the Gorka district of Nepal. This disaster killed almost 9,000 people and injured 22,000. And this horror in most cases caused by collapsed buildings in the earthquake. Many data scientists have been working hard to improve the survival rate of the next earthquake. And our mission is to build a predictive machine learning model to investigate and understand the risks of damage in case of another natural disaster. The result of our findings is available for mitigation of which buildings might need strengthening before the next earthquake. And by this, not only the memorial buildings and homes could be saved, but also thousands of lives. And I just have been talking about data scientists. Now, let me tell a bit about what is data science and um, what data scientists are doing. So data science is really just an umbrella term and it refers to figuring out ways uh, to study and solve problems with data. And to do that effectively, you need a range of skills like computer science, mathematics, statistics, and whatever domain you are in, you need expertise in that domain. For example, this project, so for this project, you might need to understand architecture and some kind of forecasting of natural disasters. And data scientists are absolutely obsessed with data. So the first thing we always do if we have a problem to solve, that we're looking around for all the possible data sources which we can bring to bear on this problem. And then we have to figure out how do we acquire the data, like how do we get it into some systems like to a data warehouse, data bricks, or maybe Azure Machine Learning Workspace. But of course, the data is not always arriving in the shape we hope for. So we might have to spend a lot of time on transformation, cleaning, reshaping, and so on. And then 
we need to understand the relationships in the data set. Like, what is the data trying to tell us about the problem we are trying to solve? Like, which of the features or variables actually seem to be useful and which may just add noise to the situation? And finally, we are going to do some predictive analytics or machine learning modeling. And through modeling and the results we generate, we hope to deliver value back to our customers or end users, which helps them drive decisions and make them even better also. I often see confusion around the term machine learning and AI. Now, let me try and clarify how these are connected to each other. So artificial intelligence is a technique that enables computers to mimic human intelligence. And it includes machine learning, which is a subset of artificial intelligence. Then machine learning includes techniques such as deep learning, which are neural networks that permit a machine to train itself. And with machine learning techniques, we can enable machines to improve at tasks with experience. But like, how a machine can be trained? Let's see some machine learning techniques, the supervised and the unsupervised learning. When we talk about supervised learning, imagine it like I am providing you some features and labels. A feature could be, for example, images about apples. And I also give you a label which, is say, which says apple. So I'm saying that on these images, you can see apples. So you will know next time if I give you an image about an apple without a label that it is an apple. And this is how the machine learns. It is going to get some, some experience data or some features, some examples, and also a label to which it can connect this information to. When we talk about unsupervised learning, imagine it's like that, that I'm throwing you data like one blue Eva and two free, um, I don't know, Ellen. <laughs> and, you know, like you can see some pattern in the data. You have seen some numbers, maybe some colors, some names and so on. So unsupervised learning is when a machine tries to decide itself whether there is a pattern in the data and use that in the future uh, to learn from it. We are mostly going to focus on supervised techniques today. And there are several specific types of, uh, of uh, supervised learning. When the data is being used to predict a category, supervised learning is also called classification. And when a value is being predicted, for example, um, car prices next year, the supervised learning is called regression. And the approach that anomaly detection takes is to simply learn what normal activity looks like and identify anything that is significantly different. And there are a lot more that we could talk about, but uh, maybe these are the ones that uh, you can start with. Now, let me sketch you up the main steps you need to take while working with the machine learning model. First of all, we need to prepare the data. So we pull in the data into some system and prepare it for training. And this involves data cleaning, for example, when we exclude data that gives noise, transformation, and uh, splitting. When we are splitting the data to train and test data, because then the trained data will be used to train the model, and we can use the test data to basically evaluate our model. We are going to see how this works during the demo part. And then we can finally train our model. And training a machine learning model starts with choosing which specific algorithm we want to configure our model with. And you maybe choose a not perfectly fitting model first, but the next steps support you to improve your models. And it is maybe necessary to retrain a well-fitted model if there is a change, for example, in the data. The next step is to score the model. And this is the process of uh, generating values based on a trained machine learning model. And this generic term, the score, is used rather than prediction because the scoring process can generate so many different types of values, like a list of recommended items, numeric values, a predicted outcome, and so on, depending on what data you provide and how you train your model. And then evaluation, 
which basically is a metric that tell you how good your model works. For example, the accuracy for predictive model means that how well does it predict the future? And what we want to do today is to build a predictive model which is able to answer our question by learning from the data we provide, which buildings are in danger when another earthquake comes. Predictive analytics deal with designing statistical models or machine learning models that predict. And these models are calibrated on past data. So, you know, the features or, or yeah, the value variables. <clears throat> and they learn from this to predict the future. So the labels, right? And this whole together we call experience data. And while working with a predictive model, you should keep in mind that it's not always working perfectly for the first try and that you might have to apply some improvements on your data sets, your algorithms and so on. But the best result is the aim, which is why machine learning itself is also an always improving field. <clears throat> Teaching a machine might sound like some kind of black magic, but thanks to the tools provided by Azure, you have the chance to easily get started with machine learning and learn about the different training algorithms and then understand what the result tells you with the use of Azure Machine Learning. So what is Azure Machine Learning? This web experience called the Azure Machine Learning Workspace brings together data science capabilities and machine learning assets into a single web pane that streamlines machine learning workflows. And there is this enterprise edition, which caters to data scientists across diverse skill levels from no code authoring to code first experiences. You can access machine learning for all skills to boost productivity. You can rapidly build and deploy machine learning models using tools that meet your needs regardless of the skill level. You can use the no-code designer to get started with machine learning, or you can use the built-in Jupyter notebooks for a code-first experience. And you can also accelerate model creation with the automated machine learning. And you can access built-in feature engineering, algorithm selection, and a lot more features to develop high accuracy models. Together with Azure Machine Learning, you can set up operationalizing at scale with the robust MLOps. MLOps, or DevOps for Machine Learning, streamlines the machine learning lifecycle from building models to deployment and management. You can use machine learning pipelines to build repeatable workflows, and you can use a rich model registry to track your assets. And you can also manage production workflows at scale using advanced alerts and automation capabilities. You can take advantage of built-in support for popular open source tools and frameworks for model training and inferencing. You can use familiar frameworks like PyTorch, TensorFlow, Scikit-Learn, and a lot more. You can also choose the development tools that best meet your needs, including popular IDEs, Jupyter Notebooks, CLIs, or languages like Python and R. And last but not least, you can build responsible AI solutions on a secure, trusted platform and access state-of-the-art technology for fairness and model transparency. You can use model interpretability for explanations about predictions to better understand model behavior. And you can reduce model bias by applying common fairness metrics that's automatically making comparisons and using recommended mitigations. And the enterprise gate security, withdrawal-based access control, and virtual network support would protect your assets. You can set up audit trail, quota and cost management, and uh, you can you know, advance your governance and control. We will talk a lot about these in the in the session. So this is the top level resource for Azure Machine Learning, providing a centralized place to work with all the artifacts you create when you use Azure Machine Learning. So the workspace keeps a history of all training runs, including logs, metrics, output, and the snapshot of your scripts. And you can use this information to determine which training run produces the best model. 
and you can deploy your models to Azure Container Instances, Azure Kubernetes Service, to FPGA, and also to an Azure IoT Edge device as a module. Then, okay, I don't have the diagram, but uh, I wanted to show you a diagram which shows you the different components of the workspace. But the most important one is when you create the workspace, you also get associated resources that are also created for you. This is the storage account, application insights, the key vault, and, and, uh, and, uh, and so on. So I am going to show you around uh, all the all the uh, components of this designer now with the use of our story about the Nepal earthquakes. And I'm going to start with the machine learning notebooks, which is a fully managed cloud-based solution for data scientists to get started with machine learning. And deeply integrated with Azure machine learning workspaces and data stores. And it provides first class experience for model authoring through integrated notebooks into um, Azure Machine Learning, Python and R SDK. So with notebooks, we can leverage management and enterprise readiness capabilities for IT administrators. And it makes your work more productive. You can build and deploy models easily using integrated notebooks and uh, these popular tools. And it enables you to collaboratively debug models and share notebooks within the boundaries of the workspace. And notebooks are managed and secure. Managed virtual machine form factor ensures compliance with enterprise security requirements. And they are pre-configured with up-to-date machine learning packages, GPU drivers, and literally everything data scientists would need to save time on sit-up desks. Notebooks are also fully customizable. It provides broad support for Azure VM types and persisted low-level customization. So I'm going to demonstrate how to use notebooks with a real life scenario. So uh, the Central Bureau of Statistics uh, co collected a large data set, which uh, contains valuable information about numerous properties like area, age, demographic statistics, and a lot more about buildings that have collapsed in an earthquake in Nepal. So what we want to do is to build a predictive model which is able to answer our question by learning from the data we provide. So which buildings are in danger when another earthquake comes? And to see how the notebooks works, uh, we are going to start by understanding the data. So the aim is to see which values are useful features for us and which are the ones we could leave out because just give noise to the observation. And uh, just a quick disclaimer, I'm going to show only examples, not the entire research I did on this problem. So let me start by creating a machine learning environment. So if you have an Azure subscription, you can just go ahead and say create a new resource. And we start looking for machine learning. And we say click create. And I choose a working uh, subscription, like why not? And then we need to create a resource group. So a resource group is really useful because um, you can just easily create one by, by uh, adding a name here, or you can use an existing one. And inside the resource group, you would put resources that would communicate to each other often. And it's also useful to, to easier manage these resources as, as, a, as a group, right? And you can, or if you, if you delete the resource group, all the resources are deleted with it. So it is, it is a good idea to put, for example, um, when you, when you like uh, put together a service, put them in the same resource resource group so they can be managed together. And as I said, together with the machine learning workspace, some uh, additional um, tools are added for you. So the storage account, so if you give it a name, something you put in a region, and then a storage account, a keyword, and apps insights are also generated for you. And you can create a container registry. You can create here or you can use an existing if there is any, or we can just create a new one. 
and you can go with the standard or basic one because uh, it only uh, if if it is like so if it is like a premium it's just a uh, more expensive um, but otherwise it uh, may be a bit faster too. But in general, the compute that we generate inside the uh, 4DA experiments are more important. So we can just create a registry here. I know it won't like it, I don't know, like something, something. So the point is that you just give, give it a name and then click save. And then um, we can just click uh, review and create and then your workspace is generated. And then the deployment was successful. You can go to your uh, overview of the machine learning workspace and click launch studio. And when you do that, you should see the following uh, overview. So. I also wanted to quickly show you the left panel here. You can see uh, the free tools that you can also see over there. We, we see our assets like the data sets, experiments, pipelines, models, and endpoints. Endpoints, this is where our model is going to get when, uh, when it is deployed. So this is where you can reach them from. And we can manage our computes, our environments, the data source, and so on. So I would like to start with notebooks. And before I continue from here, I would love to get some uh, feedback from you, whether you have used uh, Jupyter Notebooks before. You can put it in the chat if you have experience with the Jupyter Notebooks. I'm asking this because if you take a look at this overview for those who have been working uh, with this tool, you can see that a very similar folder structure is available for you. You can just pull in your data that you want to play with and you have this um, uh, cells uh, where you put in your code and you can run it uh, cell by cell. And to run the code here, you need to create a new compute or start the one that you have here. And uh, remember to stop it because otherwise uh, it can be quite costly. I, I learned it on my own mistake. <laughs> so if you want to create a new compute, you just click plus, give it a name. Um, yes, and you can choose between CPU or GPU, and there is always one that is recommended for you, but you can select from all the different machines that uh, that is available in here, and you just click Create. But now we have a compute, and, and I don't need to restart it now, since our code, just like in Jupyter Notebooks, um, and the results are also saved with the notebook in the cloud which is really cool. And again, everything, like mostly all the packages are integrated for you, so you can just go ahead and like use Pandas package for create a data frame from the data set, which is here as a CSV files. And, uh, and then we can display in line. And you can see there are many, many columns like about each buildings, like the number of floors, the age, area, height, and so on. And these columns will be used as features for training the predictive models. And just for fun, because I like playing, I would like you to remember these, uh, this information specifically. <laughs> we have like 39 columns and a lot of rows. So when we have a set of observation, it is useful to summarize features of our data into a single statement called descriptive statistics. And instead of scrolling through and try to understand just by looking at this data, you can just go ahead and use some nice Python function functions. And the one that I'm talking about now is the describe function. And what we can see here in the first row um, is that how many not new values there are in each of the columns because Python's describe function counts only the not empty fields. Another nice observation is that here we have 31 columns. Why is that? So we have lost eight columns from our data set. So where is that? Any answers and ideas you have, like just put it in the chat. So we will revisit this question later. In the meantime, another observation is at the columns starting with has underscore, like this one here. 
because the minimum here is zero and the maximum is one. And I could assume that these are probably true or false values, but I cannot be sure about it right now. But we can check it on, for example, on this column with the use of the unique function. And this shows the distinct values of the chosen column. So now we are sure that these columns hold true and false values. Another observation we can make here, for example, in the age column, where the minimum is zero, the mean is like 26.5, but it can go up to 995. We can also use a visualization tool just in case to have like a graphical overview of the data. And again, I'm showing these because it's like cool, right? Like in the notebook inline, you can like show these graphics and you can straight ahead have some information about your data. <clears throat> so in the case of the age, we can see that uh, this is the mean here, this blue box over there. And most of the buildings are between zero and 200 years, which are very close to the mean. And there are some outlier values, which around 995 years, which are probably memorial buildings. All right. Now I load in another data set, which is going to hold our labels. And these columns will be used together with the features as experience data while training the predictive model. And the label column is the damage grade is over there. This one. This indicates how high is the risk of damage for the building in case of another earthquake. We can further investigate the label column by running the following code here. And you can see that there are three different values in the damage grade column. The one is the low risk of damage, two is the medium risk of damage, and three is the high risk of damage. And also the number of features that are available for each of the labels. The best case would be if these numbers were roughly equal, so like closer a bit to each other, so it is visible that the number two has much more examples than the label one and three. And this is a big problem because if the model is trained on more examples with label two, it more often returns the label two, so the medium risk of damage, even when the risk is supposed to be high or low. We will talk about this later because we will try to fix this problem. And we can additionally observe whether there is a relationship between the different columns. For example, here we see the correlation between the damage grade and the age column, which is positive, which means the older the building, the higher is the risk of damage. So let me step back a little bit to our question. So why the describe function has only 31 columns when our data set had 39? Are there any answers in the chat? Because if not, no, then I'm just, we don't know. Then, <laughs> <laughs> then uh, it's, it's because the describe function only shows the numerical columns. Of course, because as you can see, the describe function shows statistics. How can statistics be done on text data, for example? So we have eight uh, non-numerical columns in our data set. We could play around with them to make them numerical, but we will skip that for this session on purpose because I wanted to show you some other tools as well. Because I've shown you these statistics because we are going to solve all these issues in the future steps. For example, the outlier values in the age columns, the non-numerical columns, and the unbalanced data as well. So our machine learning models can work with quality data. And this is all nothing. You can even write your own machine learning models and data science tasks right here in the notebooks. So instead of building data wrangling actions and predictive machine learning models from scratch, let me show you the next tool in the machine learning workspace. The machine learning designer. Data scientists can use a rich set of built-in algorithms, feature engineering and module evaluation to quickly build machine learning models or prototypes. And machine learning experts can visually craft their complex machine learning uh, pipelines with their own code. Uh, 
And machine learning engineers can construct the operations pipeline in the similar drag and drop approach. You can use built-in modules like data visualization, model evaluation, and you can automatically generate your scoring files, register models, and build images using Kubernetes service for scale. You can also add custom code to run Python and R within the experiment. So it brings you the drag and drop for a flow capability to simplify the process of building and testing and operating machine learning models. So I'm going to show you how this drag and drop functionality works. So let's hop over back to my demo over the main page and I start up the designer now. You see, you can create a new uh, pipeline yourself or you can use some pre-built samples as well, uh, which, uh, which uh, allows you to try out some of the solutions. I have created one for you. And for those who have been working with the Azure Machine Learning Studio before the Classic Studio, it might be familiar for you. Uh, and if you have worked with it, please like give me just a feedback in a chat. It would, it would be nice to get some answers from you, whether you have like experience with this. But this environment is really similar and a lot of lot of new stuff is added, like pre-trained models for recommendations or for computer vision, text analytics, anomaly detection, and so on and so on. And it's really cool. So I pulled in a data set that holds already all the information that uh, we have seen in the previous part of the demo. I'm just going to close this so you can see a bit more over here. Yes, yeah, so this is the same exact data set like we've worked with before. We have the, the damage grade as well in the end, which and you show you can see like uh, statistics about this um, column to see how unbalanced our data is. <laughs> it's really cool. All right. So, um, right, and then. What we want to do first is to exclude noisy values, such as the non-numerical columns that we are that were not shown in the described functions results. What we can do is to use the select columns in dataset, and um, you just why doesn't oh, come on? Yes, and and what you can do is just define which columns to include or exclude. I just show you quickly that you can basically make changes in here. And you can say that uh, you either include or you can add the new rule and you can just exclude the columns by column name or, or whatever you want to do really. It's pretty cool. All right. And another step of data pre pre preparation is called normalization to exclude outlier values like we have seen, for example, at the age column. But the goal of normalization also to change the values of uh, numeric columns in the data set to use a common scale without distorting differences or losing information. And this is useful since most of the columns have different metrics with different scale. And now all the columns will be on the same range. I quickly show this to you because it's really ugly, but it's going to be really useful for our machine. Yes, it's, it's really ugly. So, the challenge of working with imbalanced data sets in most machine learning techniques is ignored and in turn have a poor performance. Although if you think about it, um, typically the performance on the minority class is also very important. And in our case, the high risk of damage is a minority class, for example. And I'm using this SMOTE approach with the help of this technique. I can provide the model close to equal number of samples for each of the labels. Uh, sorry, no, I don't want to register this data set. I just wanted to show it to you. So see, this is the damage grade column. And now we have almost close to equal amount of features for each of the labels. And now finally, with the help of the split data uh, module, we're going to create data for training and testing. And I set the fraction to 0.7, which means 7% will be used for training and 30% will be used for evaluation. So finally, we are ready to train our model. For this, first we need to choose the best fitting algorithm. 
And there are several specific types of uh, supervised learning that are represented within the designer, like the classification, the regression, and so on. And when you're not entirely sure which algorithm works better for your specific data set, you can just investigate that by pulling in two or more algorithms in the same time and then uh, just uh, pull it into the evaluation model. So it is going to make a comparison between your models. So I chose a classification model which is used when a category needs to be defined. Like in our case with the damage grade because we have like three categories right to choose from. And during training, we can also use the two model hyperparameters, so the best fitting parameters will be defined and used for the iteration to reach better prediction results. And then scoring the model means that it does the prediction and the results can be visualized. And uh, it shows the damage grade that is uh, chosen for the specific building and the probability of choosing the specific categories for each of the building. And evaluation is an essential step by building machine learning models because it tells us how well our model works. And I'm just quickly show it to you. Uh, this result is not that cool yet like it was in the in the previous uh, version of machine learning, but they are working on it. But you can see my machine is like 80% sure about uh, which buildings gets uh, which damage grade. So thanks to all these built-in modules, you can quickly build an experiment and find out by incremental trials which setup works best for your scenario. And when you're happy with the model, it can be deployed and used in production too. And if you don't want to spend your time on figuring out the best fitting algorithm for your scenario, maybe you want to look at the last element <clears throat> sorry, of the Azure Machine Learning workspace, which is the automated machine learning. And with automated machine learning, you can automatically build and deploy predictive models using the no-code uh, UI of automated machine learning. And by that, increase productivity with easy data exploration and profiling and with intelligent feature engineering. You can easily create accurate models customized to your data and refined by a wide array, wide array of algorithms and hyperparameters. And you can responsibly build AI solutions with AutoML. Let me show you quickly around how this works. <clears throat> because as I mentioned before, it is a really easy to use UI. You basically come to the automated machine learning, click on new automated machine learning, choose a data set that we want to work with. You can even yes, take a review on that. And then in the next step, we need to uh, either select um, an existing experiment or you can create a new one or target column or label column is damage grade and we also choose a compute cluster where this is going to run and then we choose classification we can enable deep learning for better results and when you click the finish button the run starts up and after initializing uh, the run we can also review all the models that has been tried and the one on the top would be with the best accuracy and we can also see an explanation about this. We can take a look at uh, some information like uh, what are the important features. So you know you get a really good overview of how your model works. What are the important features that that uh, that your model uses and um, Additionally, there was one more thing I wanted to quickly show you. If we go back to, to here and take a look at the overview, and if there, you, this is the overview, and the best algorithm was this one. But you can also take a look at this runs data guardrails, and it also talks about the unbalanced data that I mentioned to you before. So what I wanted to do is that provided some uh, balanced data and then run this again. So what I did in the experiment that we were playing with before, after preparing the SMOT data, the results, I saved it to uh, CSV. But what you can also do is basically register this data set. And when a registered data set comes 
over here, then you can use it all around in the workspace. So I went back to automated machine learning and made a balanced run. And then I went to the data card rails, for example, and now it says that it is quite balanced. Now we can work with this, which is pretty cool, right? All right. So with that, we are nearing the end of the session today. However, while this is the end of the session, it does not have to be the end of your journey with Azure AI. I'm just going to uh, go to uh, the place what I wanted to show you quickly. Um, yes, maybe this one here. I'm just going to move there. So if you want to learn more about responsible AI, we have like touched a few aspects of this. You can go ahead and try out the responsible AI widgets where you can try out how interpretability works, how you can do error analysis and how you can make fair models like we did with the balanced data set. So also, some resources for you to go ahead and, and continue your journey with Azure AI. So on the first thing, you can learn some techniques like planning and creating a suitable working environment for data science workloads on Azure. You can run data experiments and train predictive models. And in addition, you can manage, optimize and deploy machine learning models into production. And on the second one, you find all the Azure machine learning related concepts that you would apply while working on data science and machine learning pipelines. And you can find all the steps I've shown you today, like creating a new workspace, how to use the notebooks, the designer, the automated machine learning. And additionally, you will find a very well detailed documentation for some other cool tools like responsible machine learning, more about MLOps, deep learning and a lot more. And with that, I want to say a big thank you for your attention. Um, and don't forget to join the quiz to win more prizes. And I hope we will meet you at the uh, next sessions as well. And uh, I also want to say a big, big, big thank you. It was a great honor to be one of the speakers of this amazing conference. And if you want to reach out and you have more questions, please don't forget to reach out to me. Thank you.